everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, my name is Amal Shabbi. I'm the head of the conservation section here at the Department of Culture and Tourism, uh, overseeing the conservation of Abu Dhabi's historic environment. I'm very happy to welcome you for this uh, first workshop for the afternoon, which will focus on uh, challenges and best practices with regards to project management. So building on six years, Aref, uh, uh, ELEF funded pro of ELEF funded projects, uh, this workshop will look at best practices and challenges when planning and implementing cultural protection projects in conflict and post-conflict uh, areas. Uh, with over 150 projects in 30 countries spanning four continents, uh, the management of projects is, ex is extremely critical to ensure that the funds the ALIF funds are effect effectively and efficiently spent and that projects achieve their uh, intended short-term and long-term goals and have a loss lasting impact. Uh, projects like the ones funded from ALIF uh, are complex, bringing together different stakeholders and project parties and offer a unique set of challenges in planning and implementation due to the very difficult and volatile context uh, and uh, affect the scope, the cost and the resources as, as well as the implementation team. Um, so I we're going to be talking about many topics today, even though we're sitting almost like a panel, this is really an interactive workshop. Uh, we're going to start with two presentations by uh, Shoshana and Shada. I will introduce all our speakers in just a second. Um, and, but really it's, it's about the questions should be coming from you rather than coming from me as the moderator. So I have questions prepared in case <laughs> I need to give everybody a bit of courage to, to start asking questions. But, um, but uh, yeah, I encourage the dialogue to come from, from the audience rather than it being a moderated panel session. So I'd like to introduce our, our, um, our panelists or workshop leaders, let's say. <laughs> so Jeff Plunkett uh, is the chair of the audit committee at ELIF. Uh, he oversees ELIF's adherence to accounting and financial standards and supervises all the audit work. And Jeff comes from um, uh, the former Global General Counsel of Natixis uh, Investment Managers. Uh, it's a leading investment management firm. And we have Laurent Oster. He's a uh, director of finance and operations at ELIF. He's been there since February 2019, and he has over 20 years of experience in financial, legal, tax, HR, governance, and administrative management, and has been serving mid sized organizations in the public, private, and nonprofit profit sectors. Uh, Shoshana Stewart uh, is a, an architect currently working as a director, uh, sorry, uh, is the president of Turquoise Mountain, sorry. <laughs> and has spent the last 16 years leading the charity to re restore and rebuild over 150 historic buildings, train over 10,000 traditional artisans and builders, and support the, sa the sale of over $12 million worth of artisan crafts. During her tenure, Soshana has expanded the initial project in the old city of Kabul across Afghanistan and to three other countries. Next, we have Alexandra Fiebig, who works as a project manager at ELIF. Before that, Alexandra worked for nine years at the UNESCO World Heritage Center. And at ELIF, uh, Alexandra follows up on projects in Afghanistan, Northeast Syria, as well as the action uh, plan implemented by ELIF during COVID-19 and after the Beirut blast, and more recently, the Ukraine action plan. And then finally, we have Shada Safi, who is an architect currently working as a director of Riwak in Palestine, which she joined in 2008. She's been leading and working on different projects, including the rehabilitation project of Beit Iqsa, Hadja, Birzeit, and Kalandia. She is interested in cultural landscape and community involvement. So I will invite uh, first Shada to present, uh, to give a little presentation, a short presentation on the work that she's been doing at Triwak. Um, and then Shoshana will also present some of the projects that she's been doing, and then we'll engage in the discussion of project management. <laughs> yes, thank you, Amal. I don't think so, this is working, is it? I, I, well, I can hear you because you're yeah? next to me. Okay. <laughs> do, do, do you mind? I can. Is she's going to move, move over? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to see the faces that I know and don't know and looking forward to learn more about the work and exchange knowledge. And thank you for Aleph and for the EGF, um, uh, for the organization of this event. 
So my name is Shada Safi. I'm the director, I'm an architect, but also the director of Rewalk. And Rewalk is uh, an organization that was founded in 1991 with the aim of protecting cultural heritage in rural Palestine. Um, I wanted to, to go through a very quick journey of what Rewak does to put you more in a context before we do some sort of summary of some practices or exchanging practices. So the aim is safeguarding and rehabilitation of culture. You can't see, right? I can just go. Don't worry about me. So it's the rehabilitation of cultural heritage in rural Palestine. And when we talk about cultural heritage, we're talking about neglected spaces. This is, for example, the village of Rantis near Ramallah. You can see that it's abandoned, partially or totally demolished. Uh, there's no um, right or correct or strong legal framework to protect those uh, heritage. There's also uh, the lack of awareness, the lack of resources. And yet, this cultural heritage is really rich. It re represents not only the, the architectural and the stone, but the story behind it. The relationship of people, the crafts, their, uh, uh, their daily life. So our mission is for the protection of cultural heritage in rural Palestine, and the idea is to bring life back. Because we believe the ultimate goal of protection is bringing people back to their heritage, being the keepers of their own heritage. If there's a person in the cultural uh, center or the historic center or the historic building breathing, taking care of it on a daily basis, the, the building is protected. If it's part of its daily life, socioeconomic development, it's protected. So we have a number of uh, projects or programs. The first one is the job creation. Uh, we tend to... Uh, create jobs through conservation because conservation is a labor-intensive uh, uh, process. It uh, creates lots and lots of jobs uh, throughout the process of conservation. And we also tend to work on the preserving of the know-how because for a, for a long period we were losing the know-how behind the traditional crafts, traditional building techniques. There's also the regeneration of the most uh, 50 significant uh, historic centers. To be uh, rehabilitated as a whole historic center, to be used by the community, including housing, uh, traditional markets, cultural centers, infrastructure, playgrounds for children. There's also the issue of uh, community engagement and having the community as safe guardians, but also as real partners within the process. And the idea is that to transfer the ownership from us as initiators to the community. There's also the capacity building. We've been talking a lot about capacity building and having uh, the know-how within architects, artisan, craftsmen, and engineers. So we host lots uh, and organize lots of uh, capacity building trainings and workshops for students within Palestine, but also from abroad. And we also dig and have some sort of research with local crafts. So this is a project that we've done on the traditional tiles, the color traditional tiles, and the molds, how they were used to, do, to be done, how to keep uh, maintaining, producing them locally. And it has also its an environmental approach because we focus on locally produced material. Uh, we also are concerned and uh, in knowledge uh, production and transfer. So we have a series of books that talks about cultural heritage and documents cultural heritage in Palestine. And it's really, really critical in the sense that it's written by Palestinians. So it doesn't have this sort of a colonial or orientalist approach. It's written by Palestinian architects, archaeologists, researchers, historians about Palestinian heritage or cultural heritage in Palestine as, as its layers. So with Aleph, uh, we have done two amazing uh, pro projects. One of them is uh, <coughs> the Bitillo project. I think I have my own water. Yeah, water. Yeah. That's the, the bad thing about having lunch before, <laughs> before the presentation. <laughs> <coughs> so Bitillo is a village near Ramallah, but it's located in Area C partially. So uh, with the divisions, it also has the, the issue of uh, wh wh where is it controlled by? Who is it controlled by? 
It's not totally controlled by Palestinians. It has the issue of settlements around it. Uh, so it, it faces the loss and uh, of cultural heritage. And this is the mansion where we tackled the preservation or the conservation project. A very nice uh, architecturally mansion, yet it's, uh, demol it's getting demolished. Uh, it's getting structural instability. Uh, this is the mansion from inside. You can see uh, some of the rooms are totally demolished. It has no ceiling. Uh, the circulation within the, the, the mansion is also problematic. And it's losing its uh, architectural and aesthetic and also its uh, relation with the young uh, generations. So we've done, we've been through the process of... Uh, of documentation because we believe documentation is the main uh, or the key element in the process. Once you document, you understand better, you go through the process and you understand the, 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 not only the aesthetic and the architectural value, but also what's the story behind it. Lots of mapping. You can see also here how the, the, the soil erosion is affecting the, the mansion. Here also some structural instability. And also we've done some uh, research on the circulation because the damages on the walls uh, and some of the vaults affected the, the, the accessibility to some rooms. Then we've done some planning and the process of designing for adaptive reuse. It was done with, in, uh, in collaboration with the Women Association, who would be the operating partner uh, at a later stage, so dividing their, their places, their kitchen. And this is the place after renovation. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not the updated one. I have some slides for Maya from Aleph visiting this uh, place. It was also uh, this sort of relationship between Aleph and us and being there physically really embraces the, the, the process. The second impo uh, interesting example is the project in Gaza. Uh, we've, we've been keen to work on Gaza on a yearly basis, at least initiate one project in Gaza because it's a very difficult uh, area. We as Palestinians from the West Bank can't reach there, so for years and years we have been working through the capacity building of having another partner working there, uh, working through Skype. At that time there was no Zoom, it was Skype. So, And each year we have a project, so this is Saint, uh, the monastery of Saint al Khadr in Dir al Balah, and it's, it hosts hundreds and hundreds of uh, children on a daily basis because it's the only space that is available, safe, available for kids. Uh, in 2020, uh, we launched uh, the, the campaign, uh, because after the, the last uh, blasts in 2021, after the blasts on uh, Gaza, uh, Basma organization lost two of her uh, uh, premises in the towers that were uh, bombed. So together we launched a campaign where people, ordinary people, ordinary organizations, and people who believed in the work of uh, providing uh, safe spaces for Basma, but also for cult cultural institutions in Gaza, joined. And Aleph joined as well. Uh, UNESCO joined. Uh, we have the Jerusalem Trust from uh, uh, USA who joined, and hundreds and hundreds of people who shipped from uh, $100 to $100. And we were able to do the restoration for Basma Association. And finally, Basma has moved their premises from the, ren the rental spaces to the preserved space in Al-Luhedi in uh, Gaza. The last uh, thing that I would, or the last example that I would like to, to uh, go through is uh, what we call the life jacket. 
It's the story of the rural Jerusalem. Rural Jerusalem, we have many fragmented uh, uh, villages that lost their relationship with their home city, Jerusalem. They're uh, related to Jerusalem, but physically they can't access Jerusalem. So we have Bit Hanina, Bit Iksa, Qalandia, El Jeeb, Jaba. So, and they, they have many physical obstacles and uh, from the apartheid wall to the, the uh, checkpoints that they can't really reach Jerusalem. Uh, so the, we decided to reconnect those historic centers throughout their communities and throughout their historic centers. So we have uh, Jaba, uh, Qalandia, for example, nobody knows that Qalandia exists as a village. Everybody knows Qalandia al-Hajj is the checkpoint, Qalandia the airport, Qalandia the, the refugee camp, but nobody knows or, that Qalandia as a village exists. So we started with the oral history because these villages were disconnected, fragmented, to try to reconnect them throughout their, historic, their histories and discover that, for example, in al Jeeb, they would have uh, provided clay or pottery from uh, around 2,000 years ago and imported. Lots of oral history sessions to understand and do mapping, and lots of community mobilization to plan before doing the physical intervention. And also we have uh, local uh, communities, not only as individuals, but also as governmental bodies with us. So ha we have the municipalities, we have uh, uh, the uh, local scouts, the local women association, all on board in the planning process of the rehabilitation. This is, for example, Kufur Aqab. This is before renovation. And you can see, like people would say, it's better to demolish it because it's a hazard. It's very dangerous for us to go through. And this is after it's preventive conservation and the early phases of renovation. And the issue is also about bringing life back. So we have lots of uh, the idea of uh, transforming uh, Kufur Aqab from uh, an abandoned historic center to a, an environmental and cultural hub. And it won the Halsem Award for its environmental approach in 2020. Uh, on the Middle East and uh, Asia, Asia region. And we have lots of communities who moved, of uh, cultural institutions who moved partially off uh, their premises or part of their programs in the culture, in the historic center. So we have the Visual Arts Forum, we have the Palestine Writing Workshop, we have Dali Association, we have the Local Scout, we have uh, the Visually Impaired Persons having a library there. So this is before renovation, and this is after renovation. And even the community garden where you used to have this common uh, a, a place where they put their tomatoes and onions were revived back because it's part of the history. This is also before renovation, and this is after renovation. This is the Dali Association. This is us with, uh, with the municipality planting a tree and putting, you know, part of their socio-economic development plans. The historic center is part of their plans, their, their uh, development plans. And now we're having more people in the historic center, we're having more events, and the concept is to have the historic center for the future, for the present and for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shada, for you. highlighting all these examples of wonderful projects. Uh, now, Shoshana, would you like to go through sure. your slides? Hello, Iktir. What a, a, um, I will have trouble following that. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, this is such a great conference. Uh, as I said to Valerie downstairs, this is like my favorite people in the world, um, people I've known for a long time from Afghanistan and elsewhere and newer friends, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, I suppose, you know, the North Star of Alif, preserving and promoting cultural heritage in conflict, is what Turquoise Mountain does. 
So we share completely the values of this organization, and it's just fun to be in a conference with everybody doing that. Um, so what I thought I'd do is tell you a little bit about what Turquoise Mountain does uh, to share and to form the context for a conversation about project management. Mostly focus on Afghanistan, which is where we've been working for 16, 17 years, and which is the most holistic set of work and therefore the most complex in all of auditing and all of those sorts of things. Um, but Aleph has been an amazing partner there. So, Turquoise Mountain. Um, this is Saida. She is a jeweler in Afghanistan. She went through our Institute for Afghan Arts and Architecture as a jeweler. Uh, she made this piece for the Smithsonian Museum in Washington uh, and has run a business in Kabul for the last seven, eight years, continues to run a business in Kabul. So let me transport you to the center of the old city of Kabul, one part, of, one neighborhood of it, called Murad Khani, and it's right on the banks of the Kabul River, right across the street from the presidential palace. A place of these incredible courtyard buildings, mud brick, timber frame courtyard buildings. But when we began in 2006, you know, all the white stuff is snow, those are collapsed buildings. So about half the building stock had already collapsed and we were losing many buildings per winter. So we started restoring the buildings. This is before and after. I'm a little jealous of your fade technique. <laughs> um, but you know, seeing these things transformed is one of the joys of working in built heritage, I think. So we restored 150 of these buildings, everything in that neighborhood, and trained about 4,000 traditional builders. That's masons, carpenters, electricians, architects. There they are. <laughs> Um, and then in the intangible world, and um, Dr. Westerman has been quoted a couple of times today, I too don't find the distinction between tangible and intangible particularly um, relevant. I, I know that it exists, of course, but you know, <laughs> what we're talking about here is particularly carpenters, right? We're training on architectural woodwork, very fine floral carving, and then we're making products to sell that are objects, and that is a, a building tradition and a craft tradition and all those things. So practically, it feels to me like those, that's absolutely a, a combined. Uh, but we do have an institute for Afghan arts and architecture, and the, this is the reason we exist, is be the idea that after, at that point, about 30 years of war in Afghanistan, the masters just didn't hand down what they knew. They had stopped producing, they had no students, khalas. And so we wanted to get the younger generation trained again. Um, and so I will move on now to our collaborations with Alif. So one of the projects we have is the Murad Hani Revival Project, which is about restoring a number of buildings in this neighborhood. One of them, um, very serendipitously, this was one of those empty snow plots. So we've been infilling to re-establish the historic footprint and to make sure that there are usable spaces for the community. Okay, then the Taliban takes over Afghanistan. Um, and one of the things, and I know my friends in the Aga Khan Trust for Culture and Dafa you know, are dealing with similar things. One of them is that for female students and male students, they need to be in separate spaces. Okay, so now we need to reorganize and make classroom space for female teachers, female students, and all the women's own businesses. So one of the buildings we've done together is now the Women's Center, and that is where you have calligraphy, miniature painting classes. This is a student, but this is an entirely handwritten and hand-illuminated Quran on silk uh, that we did a couple of years ago. Jewelry businesses. Um, this is a line for the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. That is Saida actually making her collection for Ishkar, which is a London and Paris-based e-commerce site. So this is all happening in this building that we work together on with Aleph. So thank you, Aleph. Um, also, you know, a set of buildings that were destroyed by a fire, and you know, these are these are community houses. And so we need to work with families to just get them restored as quickly as possible so people can move back in. Um, this is a wonderful bit of this is one side of the courtyard. Uh, and again, this is a process of, of training also. 
And then I'll end on this, which is a project that is about to start. Um, and actually, my colleague Felicity here is our deputy country director and lives in Afghanistan. Um, this is her baby. She's also um, a built, our built heritage specialist. This is a caravan sarai in Bamiyan, in the central highlands of Afghanistan, which, for those of you who don't work in Afghanistan, it's the place that became sadly famous through the destruction of the Buddhas by the Taliban the last time. Um, this is the most extraordinary piece of built heritage, very special. But the exciting thing is that this should uh, be a project that is everything that I care about, and I saw it very much in, in Shadda's presentation about bringing these sites back to life. If they are restored and they sit empty, it doesn't work. It's got to matter to the community because they'll take care of it, but also because people need livelihoods. They need it to matter. So we run two weaving centers across the street from this thing, uh, and we created about 18,000 full years of employment in carpet weaving over the last four years or so. Uh, that's mostly through selling a lot of carpets and <laughs> working, uh, working with thousands of weavers. That is one carpet, obviously. There it is. It's so pretty. So you have this incredible built heritage, and this is you know, an old drawing of what the, one of you know, dozens of these vaulted spaces. But then it is about making this into a carpet washing and finishing center. So it becomes the center of exporting carpets from Bamiyan. And we also run two primary schools in Bamiyan. And so if we succeed at this, this is everything that I want out of a project in which I appreciate Alif as a partner in, which is that it can be, first of all, the conservation of a really special piece of built heritage and intangible heritage, but also will provide livelihoods. It's about employment, it's about, it's a community washing facility, there's primary schools, literacy courses. And finally, you have a site in the middle of Bamiyan, which is an ethnic minority area of Afghanistan, which would be thriving through cultural heritage at its center, and women as the only breadwinners in their families. So I think this is a really special project, and we can absolutely do it. I mean, we're, we're, we're doing it. So, you know, the possibilities really uh, in Afghanistan are, are significant right now. Um, so uh, very briefly, we do work, I live in Jordan, so we work um, with Syrian artisans in Jordan, with Palestinian artisans in Jordan, with Jordanian artisans in Jordan, hopefully now setting up um, in Bethlehem and working with uh, Palestinians in Palestine. This is Abu Abdu, he is from Damascus, and this is a traditional Syrian wedding chest in Leighton House, a uh, house museum in London, and he's made this along with seven other pieces of furniture uh, inspired by that for their refurbishment. This is his uh, a apprentice, Mohammed Ibrahim. You very much have the master and the traditional in Muhammad Ibrahim breaking all the rules of Islamic geometry to create that bit of more contemporary mosaics. Wonderful glasswork from El Khalil, from Hebron, which we've brought uh, to try to sell in Amman. So the thing I wanted to end with was beginning to answer some of the questions posed by this workshop. One, you know, what are the difficulties that operators face when working with cultural heritage in conflict? The most fundamental one that I see is that Conflict to my 400 staff, 390 of whom live in the countries in which we work, is that you can't depend on anything. You can't depend on education, healthcare, roads, checkpoints, everything is up in the air. And so it's that silos don't work. If you want to work with a community, you got to meet everyone on, on what they need, right? Saida is not going to be able to run a jewelry business if her kids are not in school. It doesn't work. So you have to deal with all those things. So, you know, my answer to that is really about working with a community on so many different levels, forgetting about sectors. You know, I'm a cultural heritage organization. But if you talk to 10 different donors, they'll say I'm different. I'm an economic development organization for one. I'm an infrastructure organization for another. But at the center of this, and this is the final point, is cultural heritage. And I think, you know, we're a bunch of cultural heritage junkies and practitioners, so we believe in it, but a lot of the rest of the world 
thinks it's peripheral or not that important or whatever. To me, in the rest of international development, which is basically starts from the point of everything being bad, starts from deficiencies, right? You are poor, uneducated, you don't know how to treat your women correctly, you're not taking care of that. It's like the fundamental premise of a lot of the international development community. It's pretty offensive and pretty terrible as a conversation. Cultural heritage is the opposite. It says, this is an asset. It's a tradition, a building, a heritage, our inherited traditions. And that matters, and it's precious, and that you can create livelihoods from it and all that. So I do think that we can't forget that cultural heritage is a very special way, I think, to move through the world and to, to work with people across countries uh, and within our own community. So um, that is just the context of Turquoise Mountain. And we can, of course, get into like how you move money and sanctions regimes and what other, <laughs> other kind of fun things reporting that everyone wants to talk to. And thank you <laughs> again for having me. Uh, no, that's for later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you, Shoshana, uh, for, for, for your presentation. Uh, keep, keep these presentations in mind for when we start, uh, start the dialogue. And I just want to get one more intervention here from, from uh, Alexandra and, and perhaps Laurent as well about explaining what is Aleph's role in project management of projects uh, that uh, are applied to, uh, to Aleph or um, uh, funded by Aleph. Sure, sure. Maybe, maybe yeah, just to, to, to remind people, and maybe for those who are not familiar with Aleph, the fact that we are primary, I mean, we are a grant-making foundation, so we don't implement projects ourselves. I mean, we identify operators uh, uh, in the field that do it for us. So our job is to uh, sell, uh, identify projects, to uh, select operators, to do our due diligence, make sure ahead of the project that everything is under control, but we don't implement projects. Uh, so we're not, we're not pros in project management. You are the pros in, uh, you, you know the context, you know uh, the scientific and technical parts. We, we're here to support you. So it was just a few words. And perhaps to add on the, um, on what Laurent explained as uh, Alif as an institution, as a team, we're, we also try to translate that as a team, the way we work with all our partners. One, we learn through our partners. You know, the more, the more projects Alif funds, the more, the more um, knowledge we also acquire, how you manage to manage projects in these conflict uh, and post-conflict areas. And we're always, we're very open and um, the word I'm looking for is... Flexible? Flexible, no, <laughs> no we've had this exchange, this is more closer. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Collaborative. 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 <laughs> that was the word. Anyways, uh, we want to have the open communication channel because we, uh, what we, you've seen the wonderful projects they, they're doing there. Um, we want to export your models and make them, make them as viable as possible. Mm. And yeah. we're always just an email or phone call away. I mean, I think that, you know, we're talking, we're bringing together the Aleph family here to, to, you know, to, to meet everyone, to, 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 to connect, but also there's learning from each other's uh, challenges and practices. Uh, and, you know, everybody has something to contribute to the wider picture. And I think that having you know, projects that have been funded by out of benefit from, you know, this providing, you know, contributing to this bank of information that you as the funder uh, can also help disseminate across new projects that come around. <laughs> so I think that's something very important. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so speaking of challenges, I mean, Shoshana, uh, Shoshana and, and Shada mentioned, mentioned a few from the ground. 
uh, and you know, perhaps you could expand a little bit more on this, especially, I mean, Shoshana with the change in government, that was probably one <laughs> big curveball <laughs> in, uh, in your, your, your long-term goals or projects. Uh, Shada, the daily kind of uh, uh, challenges uh, are, are, you know, really impacting. And from, from Aleph's perspective, in terms of... Uh, how, what do you see as some some of the other uh, challenges that you know have cropped up across different projects? And please, anybody, raise your hand. There's mics. You can ask any questions as well. So let's start with some challenges, and then maybe you know you're you're welcome to share challenges from your projects, uh, so that we can have a, an exchange. Um, I think the challenges go beyond the f uh, physical act of having a struggle or conflict. It goes deeper. And um, like what, what we're facing here is a change in the demography, in the landscape, in the fragmentation, in the socioeconomic uh, issue of Palestinians. So uh, having people uh, who are... Uh, displaced and uh, being abroad, uh, what's the relationship with their heritage, having heritage as a private, privately owned. This sort of negotiation of people who have left uh, the place in 70 years do not have this sort of relationship. So it's, it goes beyond to uh, and, tra and transform, transforms into uh, more technical issues. So we're struggling also with the sense of fragmented ownership. We're struggling with the issue of uh, lack of awareness. We're struggling also with the fragmentation and uh, lack of access to the spaces. We're struggling of our legal system that is not able to, uh, uh, to protect the cultural heritage with the, the, the old laws that we have, uh, or, or even the new laws that are not being put in practice, they're not well supported. Um, so, And we're struggling also with the community changing uh, into modernity, into uh, more uh, of uh, um, capitalism and uh, like, like the, the, the rest of the world, but it's also happening in different uh, pace and in different uh, in the areas that we're f facing another also circumstances. So, so these are all layers of uh, challenges that uh, has has uh, the same roots, but is di diverting into different uh, impacts. Um, I'm going to go really gritty. <laughs> so, communications. Right, like our work in Afghanistan right now, I basically took down our website for a year and a half because I don't know what's safe. Everyone thinks everything in Afghanistan is closed, but it's not. However, you know, we run three primary schools and there are female teachers working for our NGO because we have special permission from the Bamiyan municipality and from the Ministry of Education for those women to come in. That's totally fine. The Taliban know everything that we're doing. The second I go on 60 Minutes and start talking about it, or I put it up on you know, a picture on Instagram of, my, of Dr. Khojistar, OBGYN, serving her patient, halas, we have to leave. So that's difficult, right? Because if you're trying to fundraise, and if you're trying to advocate for working in the place that you're working in, that's really hard. Thank you, Alif, for <laughs> allowing us not to tell anybody about the wonderful work that you're uh, enabling. Um, no, they have been very, very flexible. I think, you know, um, I think we're hoping to be able to talk more about that publicly because some of the stuff is just clearly not controversial in the slightest, and I think buildings are, are part of that. Um, second thing, oh, yeah, you know, timing and planning. As you say, like, the Taliban took over, and that was a little bit of a wrench in the works. You know, it's incredibly important uh, for donors working in, in these kinds of situations that they understand that, timing changes, right? So we asked, you know, it was a single email. Can we have a no-cost extension? They gave us a no-cost <laughs> extension. You know, there's, there's a lot about managing that process, but basically they've been, a, you know, it, it has to be like that in conflict, but thank you to them for being like that. Um, you know, we could talk forever about money, right? We, I mean, not just getting enough funding, but we implement funding in Afghanistan and in Myanmar and Burma. Those are two places under significant sanctions. So how you move money, and you know, I implement US government money 
I have a Scottish auditing firm. You know, everyone's watching that very, very carefully. So you have to move money in a responsible and transparent way, and that's not easy. Um, so those are some of the sort of more operational. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, this is what this workshop's about, is about getting down to detail, so. And as a founder, obviously, I mean, we face a lot of challenges. One of the largest, definitely, these days is channeling in the funds to uh, some countries, such as Afghanistan or Yemen or even Iraq. So it's a day-to-day it's -day challenge, and it's getting more and more difficult, as I think you, you know. Um, one other uh, challenge that we face is, for example, in certain areas, such as Mosul, the fact that we have so many projects, just Alif, but not just Alif, so many international organizations having international projects in Mosul. I mean, it means millions of dollars pouring in it's a, in such a small place with the risk of disrupting local businesses and markets. Uh, so we, I mean, our role in, in this uh, context is to uh, try to coordinate, to define common rules, how we pay people, for example. So it's a, it's a challenge that we have. Uh, in other areas, such as Yemen, the, 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 the challenge is to be able to identify operators. We just don't find the people, because uh, some of them are willing to do the project management part, but they don't want to deal with the money. It's too, too big a risk for them, so that, that type of, of challenges. <laughs> the changing environment that um, Shoshana already, I mean, I think Afghanistan is, is quite a strong and clear example, but I think in many of the countries where we work with, uh, Alif does, apart from working directly with the grantees, we also do a lot of coordination with the authorities, backstopping and so on. So and there's a cycle of projects that we have the authorities on board responsible for, for heritage couple of months, years later, you have to start again and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you have to align, um, trying to align what the organizations from the ground would like to, um, would like to come up with project ideas and also balancing with what we hear from changing, often changing, quickly changing authorities. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, you... you uh, I remember that Valerie said that there were some discussions, for example, when there was the change of government, the, uh, LF did, did come in and try to smooth things out, uh, put, you know, uh, be part of the dialogue on making, uh, valorizing cultural heritage, yeah, facilitating, uh, facilitating uh, uh, the work uh, and projects in general, not just for LF projects, but just be a, a mm -hmm. part, of the, part of the dialogue. So that's one aspect of where LF can comes in and supports uh, the implementation of projects. Yeah. So, yeah. And perhaps just another note on what Laurent said about flows of funds, but we also have to deal with very, very yeah, volatile exchange yeah, yeah, rates exactly. that, that fluctuate. Yeah. We operate in several currencies that are linked to USD. That is very complicated. I think our finance and administration team has been finding solutions. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean... Uh, when it's possible. We need to be creative, of course. Yeah. <laughs> when it's possible. And, but also thanks to, to, to the work with, uh, with the suggestions from, from organizations that have experience with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do we have a floating mic for questions from the audience? It's coming. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, second row, uh, in the front here. Will you raise your hand, sir? Vous pouvez lever la main, monsieur. Merci. Good good afternoon. Mm, how do you face? Um, comment faites-vous? <laughs> comment faites-vous pour le les projets ou les contextes dans lesquels la monnaie fluctue? alors que les, les budgets ont été établis dans la demande des projets et pour lesquels souvent soit les matériaux deviennent plus chers, soit les salaires euh, deviennent plus faibles par rapport à ce qui a été fixé. On a entendu flexibilité ce matin, mais comment est-ce qu'on réagit à ça dans les, dans les projets That's something we try to take uh, obviously in consideration at the time of the budgeting, obviously. I mean, so we, we want to, to, to know, I mean, to have the big breakdown of costs by currencies so that we have an idea of 
the risk that we're taking. There's obviously no way to hedge this risk because there is no hedging solutions for uh, local currencies. But uh, uh, and we are facing right now the 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 the, the, um, the uh, uh, price increases for raw materials. So that's something we have in, in mind, and uh, we are always open to 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 discuss. I mean, uh, to to, uh, to to discuss budget increases when it's uh, when it's uh, grounded, and uh, so it's uh, it's uh, it's something that we we have in mind because we know we're going to face these these problems uh, a lot uh, the coming months and years. So, um, but. Uh, we prefer to, I mean, we, we pay in hard cu currencies, in euros or in, in dollars, so that we don't face the problem of uh, 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 local currencies uh, losing value. Um, uh, and we tend to, I mean, we, when, especially when we work with small NGOs, I mean, we prefer to make many small installments just to, uh, because some of them, some of them just don't can, uh, they, they just can't uh, receive dollars, so they just can receive local currencies. So we prefer to make many small uh, payments so that uh, um, uh, the, um, the funds don't uh, lose their value. Sorry, can we just wait a second? Does anybody else need a translation device before we move on? Okay. Thank you. Perhaps just to add that there is a 10% flexibility that is inbuilt within the budget from, from the start, and anything okay. beyond that, that, that is a, a discussion that... Uh, I think we have mentioned, and you have mentioned earlier, that every place and every circumstance has its, uh, circumstance has its own uh, thing, and you're being flexible and responsive enough to act differently in Ukraine than... Yemen than Iraq, and this helps a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. Ah, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. Hi. Um, two challenges that I see arising. Um, one is um, not violating or not challenging local hierarchies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, what happens when a grant gives a much higher salary mm. someone than uh, the civil servants that are monitoring this, mm. for example? Um, so this is a very big challenge, and it's not always easy to get the right information as a donor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much easier to get the right information from the implementing partners, um, but even then... <laughs> It's not always possible to get the right information. So that, that I find a very big challenge in general um, because very often uh, state employees might want to actually work for a project mm -hmm. and they end up not doing their job and they end up working with a project so we're actually damaging the country rather than helping the country. So I find this a very big issue that actually has many, many consequences all, all over the place. Yeah. The second challenge that I saw from, we had two amazing projects uh, represented here. And from our community engagement work, um, we see um, that actually locals are much easier to play ball when they are engaged with heritage that they appreciate. <laughs> um, they're much less likely to play ball with haters they don't appreciate. And so in Alif's agenda, we see a lot of heritage that is dead to the locals. Mm. So it is in these particular circumstances, which are a lot, where we need a much, much greater effort at community engagement, a much, much greater effort at community engagement before even work starts. Um, just to give you an example, I'm an archeologist, so in archeology span we learn, we start an excavation when we have a particular question. Great. <coughs> but actually community engagement will change the questions in the field and will give you information from recent history, from current uses of buildings, et cetera, et cetera, that will completely change the way you're thinking before you excavate. So what you're going to find is very different 
<laughs> than if you do not do the community engagement. Um, so, I mean, they're kind of statements, but they are also cues for you to react. Thank you. I, mean, I think what the, the community engagement point was one that we had, we had discussed in our preparation for the workshop is involving the community from not just as stakeholder engagement and dialogue and see what they want, but really engage the community from A to Z in the whole project life cycle, from ideating the project, understanding the needs, resolving, you know, scoping it uh, into implementation. Uh, and afterwards, uh, post implementation, um, I think you know your your projects show that uh, in ways. And you know, uh, it, it, as far as uh, when projects come through Aleph, uh, how do you, you, you is that something that you look at to make sure that it's it's integrated as part of project proposal somehow? So, uh, who would like to start first? Okay. Sure. Um. Thank you. Yes. I I think um, this sort of dead heritage site issue as a, a, a blunt description of that is important. I, I would just flip it around a little bit, which is to say that I think we can be very procedural about it. Like, okay, what do you do? You consult the community. What does that mean? Like, we all get in a room and we have a conversation and we say, what do you want? Okay, fix my house. I'd like a salary. Like, we all want lots of them. I mean, it's, that's not how it looks, right? And, and then, you know, I don't know, I picture whiteboards. <laughs> um, my experience of that is simply that, of course, you, you, you do need to do that. Everyone needs to have a conversation about what you're going to use it for and what the priorities are, yes. But fundamentally, this is an overgeneralization. People need jobs. It needs to be a living economic success. And that, you know, it's why museums with closed doors are often some of the most problematic, you know, cultural projects, I think, or, or sort of, you know, restored buildings that are supposed to be like exhibition space. If there's no money to run it, nobody's going to go in. It, and it, I'm not sure that's because it was not an important building. I just, it's hard. So I think that, you know, if we're looking at tourism sites, that's about being really serious about how you're going to get tourists in and what they're going to buy. If it's about intangible heritage, you know, our answer to that is we got to sell it. I did not start this thinking that we were going to be selling crafts. That was not what I thought we were going to do. We, we had to learn how to do it. Um, and, and I think then in terms of maintenance structures, but again, like, you can't solve that by making a neat little, you know, cooperative management board. It, the structure is not the point. Um, it has to be much, much more real about how people are going to use it and where the money is going to come from afterwards is my primary experience with that. I also find it very interesting the way you mentioned about the interest of uh, people, if they're feeling the heritage represents them or not. And it's also changing. Now we're, for example, witnessing emerging uh, religious slash political parties that are demolishing shrines, shrines maqamat because the, it's 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 to their new perspective of religion it's not the basic religious like it's bid'a we call it bid'a so we're, we're witnessing people who we thought this heritage would represent them it doesn't represent them anymore they're not related to it to uh, to that to it and uh, you have also to get to different dialogues with your, within yourself but also with them to understand what's the logic where did it come from? Um, so it it uh, it came to my mind this example that we're witnessing changes also on what the community thinks uh, is the representation of them of their identity and what is not. And maybe regarding your questions about how we compensate uh, civil servants, I mean that's uh, d definitely a, a question we've faced many times in the, in various countries. And, um, but, you know, it doesn't matter what Alif decides in that matter, if other organizations do, uh, other international organizations do uh, other way, I mean, so, and I would say it's Alif's strength to, to talk to everybody, to have open cha discuss, uh, communication channels with these institutions and to be able to, to have a dialogue and try to find common grounds on what we should do and not do in, 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 in this context. I, f I find in general that we, we, 
don't pay the exorbitant salaries of a lot of international NGOs, but it is just the case in most places we work that it's more than a government salary, and it just is, and we can't run a project without it, so somewhere in between. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have anything else to add? To <clears throat> just perhaps to, to build on that question, I think 99%, 95% of our projects have a very, very strong local anchorage that we look at, the local partners, the, the, the salaries that are being paid to, um, to the surrounding, um, su surrounding um, uh, villages, for example, that the heritage is located in. And um, I don't, maybe because I've worked a lot in Afghanistan, but one of my favorite examples is, uh, is, the, uh, is a project implement, implemented by uh, a, Ashko, by an Afghan local organization. They have worked for three years on a big Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, sh shrine, shrine. Mm -hmm. a stupa. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. And um, for for three years, uh, in the five villages around it, um, there's more than 120 households who have uh, in the area lived from 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 this. And I mean, it is a way to create, well, it can, let's say, support throughout and just preserve a very very unique unique site. And I say 90. 95% uh, because then we also have perhaps the Arch of Stesiphon that was, um, that was already uh, mentioned today several times. That is a kind of freestanding uh, monument, not many surrounding communities, but we also feel that there is a... It, and because of its uniqueness, it is worthwhile also to uh, to to preserve it um, mm -hmm. for a kind of greater greater good. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the gentleman in the front here, in orange. Rashad. Yeah. Oh no, oh no. Yeah. Uh, bonsoir. Moi, uh, j'aimerais savoir. Ma question, c'est savoir l'endroit des des zones du Sahel. C'est-à-dire, quels critères vous vous basez pour financer les projets dans ces contextes, sachant que les besoins sont énormes C'est-à-dire, euh, les limites de, de financement, parce qu'on on a des besoins qui vont au-delà de, du financement toujours, mais quels sont les critères selon lesquels vous vous basez pour, pour financer euh, les différents projets Merci. Well, as, as, as you may know, we have two types of intakes, or even three types, but we have these calls for projects uh, once, let's say, once a year. Uh, we have the emergency, emergency projects, so it's all year long, and we have these action plans, ad hoc plans that we launch because of a, a, a specific crisis arising, such as Beirut a few, two years ago and, uh, and, and Ukraine. Uh, so obviously our, our finances are, are, are not uh, un, uh, unlimited, but from a financial point of view, I mean, it, it shall make sense. But we have projects, I mean, ranging from $10,000 to up to five, even 10 million so with our flagship projects in, in, uh, in, uh, with um, the Muscle Museum. So it's, we have a wide range of projects. I mean, from a purely f uh, financial point of view, I mean, there is space. I mean, we, we can do a lot of things. Then we have obviously other types of, of criteria, yeah. but I'll, I'll leave it to you. And, and I think the selection criteria by itself, they're, uh, they're, they remain the same for, for all the project, projects we look at. Uh, this secretariat does a pre-selection. Perhaps I can quickly talk about this as well. So we receive the projects. There's a pre-selection that uh, is being done at the secretariat level, always according to the same criteria, relevant, scientific rigor, uh, value for money, and uh, feasibility, which means mm, operation, operational uh, capacity to do so. Then on the basis of these criteria, 
the scientific committee receives uh, receives the projects with a short assessment of our side. Amel uh, is part of our <laughs> scientific committee, and she's a very active and um, very uh, uh, very active, very demanding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, member of a scientific committee so this is the next step that it goes through and once the scientific committee makes a recommendation to the foundation board the foundation board is the last instance um, so there's several levels that it goes it goes through and each let's say each um, yeah it, it, it is a difficult and demanding process but uh, that's why we end up with mm. wonderful projects. Um, I have a question. Like also. many, like many <coughs> of you. Go ahead. Um, I have a question about the coordination or relation with the other emergency or cultural heritage uh, funders. Like we have the Cultural Protection Fund, we have the Prince Klaus, the Cultural Emergency Response, the World Man Monument Fund, and Aleph as well. And you, you you're also targeting relatively same regions or, or areas where there are struggle or conflict. So are there any sort of dialogue, uh, uh, coordination? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Would you like to yes, definitely. I mean, we're, we're in very regular contact with all, uh, all these wonderful organizations. We have monthly, yes, at the moment there are monthly meetings where we, uh, where we get together for... Uh, Thanks to Zoom and COVID, it was actually properly installed during uh, during COVID times. It's a network of grant makers, and we do thematic thematic discussions. Or when there is um, when there is the uh, I don't know, certain certain events that happen, we can also meet more more frequently on on Ukraine or or Syria and Turkey. So it is a very active uh, active network, and we talk to each other. We also call each other up and say, what do you think about this organization? <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I might just, from the, to your question, sir, about what it's like from the grantees' perspective, I think we find Aleph to be a relatively manageable partner. <laughs> oh, I mean that. You know, it's it's... Uh, reports twice a year, um, which feels right for the amount of, of grant that it is, and, and that's great. There's a great uh, portal that you all use, Smart Simple, oh, right. where you, you put all your applications in there, you do your reports in there. It's very straightforward. That's quite good. Yeah, you all were great on no-cost extension. So I think we find the felicity. Anything to add on the, since you're the one writing the supports? <laughs> Mm. Totally. Sorry, could you just wait for the mic because the translators can't translate what you're saying. Sorry, <laughs> that was bad. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no, I find Smart Simple to be an excellent platform for tracking um, all of the reports that have been submitted, particularly um, you know organizations over time. I only started with Turquoise Mountain two years ago, and was able to see where our ICH project from a lift was at each stage. So I think that's a really great um, process to continue. Um, anything else to add? Oh, oh. Just on the competing uh, donor uh, challenges, I would say in Afghanistan, the challenge we're facing now is that after the fall of Kabul, most donors withdrew. Hmm. So we had a really wonderful Aleph emergency project for the ground floor of the old Kabul hotel which we completed despite the very challenging times when the Taliban first came, but other donors all withdrew. Department of State, Germans, many others are just not willing to take, uh, to take the steps or engagement that it needs to fund build heritage and conflict zones. But so these, are, these are government organizations, right? Yeah, US or, Department or, or, of State. Uh, foreign donors. Okay. Um, and so I left in Afghanistan as our only continuing donor that continues to fund build heritage. And so I think it's increasingly important, but also great to look for opportunities of how do we work more closely with the left 
to design projects that can kind of complement or fill in those mm -hmm. gaps. Yeah. In and it's our ambition to continue doing projects in Afghanistan, so feel free to submit yeah. proposals. It's music <laughs> to my ears. <laughs> Sorry, gentleman in the back there. Thank you very much, and this has been very informative. And the forum in, in general has been a wonderful opportunity to know what uh, everybody else is doing. But my question has to do with in-country. Is there some means of uh, uh, communicating, engaging, having some kind of conversation with other programs within the country? Just through this forum, I, I discovered that there's a lot that we could share with other two other programs, for example, in Iraq, where I'm working. So how can we sort of uh, get communicating in such a way as to complement and maybe build up you know, into a next stage where our work could, uh, could come together? Yeah, I think, I mean, th this is an excellent question because we were, you know, well, how do you deal with several projects in a, in a single region? Uh, and then also projects that, you know, in, in, a, in a second question, we can be dealing with like multi-phase projects like over time, so... Uh, would you like to answer that? Or? Very, very happily. I think um, the Ali Forum is one forum for that. That was That's also why it was conceived, conceived like this. Uh, I think it was mentioned before, it's been in the planning for two years and for various reasons it, it hadn't happened. So, um, And hopefully it's going to be a more regular thing. Otherwise, we have, perhaps not in, in, in that particular case, but we regularly organize um, kind of small small meetings between project operators who, who are in the same area. I'm looking at uh, our colleagues from La Guilde, from Raqqa, where really very, very regularly every, every th a couple of months, everybody sits around the Zoom for an hour, an hour and a half. Doesn't have to be very, uh, very long kind of updates each other where they go, where's the next. Um, also, they update each other on new funding opportunities, um, new phases of other projects, because we also like it when, I mean, as uh, as Laurent mentioned, Alif doesn't have infinite funds, so actually the, the other grant-making institutions also, co-funding is always welcome. Um, but yeah, we're always ready to do these. Mm -hmm. I hope. I mean, you're you're attending obviously the the majlis for Iraq. I mean, the the majlises that were the majalis that were uh, organized as part of the forum are very much done with that with that intent is really to bring everybody together to see what's going on, uh, what projects are happening, what projects may happen in the future, talk about challenges and how they've been resolved, uh, or you know continuing challenges to think of solutions together. So this is very much the point of the forum. So. Yeah, and I think a small silver, silver lining of the pandemic has been that we've come so much more comfortable of yeah, just phoning or phoning online, or yeah. getting everybody in a virtual room yeah. as well. So, so communication, communication, communication keywords. <laughs> uh, so if we're, does anybody have any more questions on challenges? Because then we can start talking about solutions. Okay, sir. So yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the main challenges that we are facing normally with the rehabilitation and also immediate action is that we are not going to have a feasibility study for one year and then designing the project and then going to implementation. Therefore, we have all together in a package that we propose to Alif. But then everything is a rough estimation. Okay, we are going to use 200 cubic meter of some material and so on. So. But in reality, this 10% feasibility to move amongst or inside one category, it's not really easy to manage at the second phase of the project. And this is the thing that is always challenging me. It's a third project that I'm working with Alif, and these are all long projects. The first year, you are happy because you have a lot of budget under each budget line. But in the second year, you have to be very, you are really restricted with that money and then you have to manage it. That was one of the problems that we faced always because the first estimation is very rough and then you are asking us for a detailed <laughs> uh, 
uh, budget breakdown in few months after the start of the project, and that time is not enough for us, particularly when you're facing some technical project, like the fifth minaret, or like, the, for example, the Balahisar in the past, and now Meseinak. You know, we are all having a lot of challenges for that. I'm happy if someone could help us how to manage this problem. Can I just second that of another co-worker in Afghanistan? We find that's the only thing I, I would say as well, is that particularly with building BOQs, like how many meter moraba of wood are you going to use? And you, there's no way you're going to count the bricks right the first time. So I think particularly for building BOQs, it would actually be easier if there... I don't know what the mechanism is to deal with that, whether there's a full realignment. Or, I don't know. But we find that a little bit difficult too. No, I mean, we, we're fully aware of these uh, challenges. So what we, 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 we tend to do these days in, is to, I mean, the, the board approves an up to amount of an envelope, which is pretty large. And usually what we, what we do is that we pay an, uh, a first installment, which, it, which makes it possible for the grantee to do a, a, a more in-depth uh, feasibility study or scoping study. And afterwards, after this, this first stage, I mean, we redefine uh, the, the budget. So um, maybe it wasn't the way we, we did uh, four years ago when we started, but that's something we, we've started implementing uh, recently, and I think that's the way to go. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, thank you all of this information. Uh, just I have a question, but I want to speak by Arabic, if you have translate. شكرا لكم على هذه المعلومات القيمة أنا أعتقد أن المجتمعات المحلية مهم جدا مشاركتهم أنا أركولوجي تخصي أثار شارك في كثير من الحفريات الأثرية وأتفق مع أحد الحضور ذكر أن المجتمعات المحلية مهم مشاركتها وإعطائها معلومة أكبر حتى يقدموا معلومة عن تاريخ المكان لكي تسهل من عملية استفادة العمل في الموقع لكن أنتم أديتوا أعمال جميلة جدا في المواقع من خلال الريبيلت إعادة الترميم والبناء من جديد لكن عندما ينتهي العمل هل تواجهون وتغادر هذه الفرق المشاريع هل تواجهون أو هل تواجه هذه المواقع مشاكل من المجتمعات المحلية مثلا تغير في شكلها لا تهتم فيها تضيف عليها مثلا مواد بناء حديثة وبالتالي المشروع اللي انتم أديتوه بصورة جميلة وجيدة يعني يخضع للتغيير بعد مغادرة الفرق أعتقد أنها من ضمن الصعوبات وأبي أعرف هل من الممكن أن المجتمعات المحلية تغير هذه المواقع أم يحافظ الموقع على شكله الأصلي بعد مغادرة فريقكم ونهاية المشروع What I think maybe from yeah, examples yeah, from sure. your own projects. Um, it's so complicated. Very important. <laughs> um, yes, people start putting satellite dishes, clamping it onto beautiful carved wood. You know, yes. Um, one of the things that I think we do, which is probably a little bit controversial, is that we don't really leave. So the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the sites in which we work, and it's why I don't take on sites very easily, it's because I intend to have a long-term relationship, like 10, 20 years with the place. But it's not me. Like, I lived in Kabul for five years, but it's, but it's my Afghan staff, and now this institute sits there. So... I'm, I don't want to, I'm not leaving. I mean, I think we, that's my honest answer to it. Because I do think that if, I do think that it's, that if you just finish a site, write a sustainability plan and go, it doesn't usually end very well. I think that where there is real tourism, that can be different. Um, I, I feel that in some of our work in Jordan, um, yeah, and, and with the caravan Sarai, part of the key of that is that the Afghan carpet industry is a viable industry. There are a million weavers in Afghanistan. 
They're taking the place that Turkey has left in terms of production of hand-knotted carpets. Like there's a real market proposition there. We're putting it into a historic building. There are, so I, I, I basically think that you can't just drop mm. off the keys and leave. Mm. But that's, so the, the mission of your organization is to actually provide that, th these community programs and these organizations. Now, in, this mm -hmm. in, the, in the example of Riwak, uh, that's, not, that's not really the case. You're mostly, you're, you, uh, you I put it as catalyst, right? Uh, yes, I am yes. going to answer okay. in Arabic in respect to it. Yes, no. uh, uh, the point that I mentioned is one of the challenges that I mentioned بصير الترميم وبصير بالطريقة الصحيحة باستخدام المواد الصحيحة بدراسة شاملة وكاملة للمبنى وأصالته وإلى آخره وبعدين لما المجتمع والمؤسسات الثقافية تأخذ المراكز ومرات كمان للسكن مرات بتحدث تغييرات لها اللي مش بالضرورة تكون مدروسة مرات بيستعملوا إسمنت مرات بضيفوا إضافات غير مرغوب فيها أو بتأثر على المبنى والفكرة إنه إحنا السياسة تبعتنا أن نقلل من هاي التدخلات بالشكل اللي بتصير فيه من خلال أول إشي تعاقداتنا مع الناس طورنا تعاقدات اللي تسيطر على هاي الموضوع ومن خلال بناء القدرات فإحنا بعملية الترميم بصير في شرح موفى وتدريب حتى للمستخدمين شو طبيعة المواد المستخدمة ليش بزبطش نستخدم اسمنت لأنه بقتل المبنى الرطوبة كيف نتخلص منها مثلا الرطوبة واحدة من العوائق الكبيرة والناس بيستصعب ويفهموا إنه المبنى عشان يتعافى من المية اللي دخلته خلال عشرين سنة بده خمس سنين يضل يتك الإصارة ويرجع يعملها والمباني القديمة أيضا قائمة على الصيانة الدورية هذا كمان مبدأ مش موجود في ال في ال في الحديثا يعني إنه الواحد كل سنة بده يعمل الإصارة بده يضبط الكحلة بده ينظف الحجر إلى آخره والإشي الجديد إنه كمان صرنا نعمل كفالة صيانة على المؤسسات الشريكة اللي بتكون معنا اللي هي مبلغ برتصد بسيطر الوضع يعني أنت ما بتقدر تعمل تغييرات اللي بدك إياها بدون استشارة إحنا منساعدك باستشارات مجانية بس إذا أحداث التغيير في المبنى بتصفي عليك زي غرامة بتدفعها لأنه كمان المباني بعد ترميمها بتعود لأصحابها ولازم تعود بالشكل اللائق لإله بحكيش إنه مية بالمية مسيطرين على الوضع بس منحاول قدر الإمكان وهي واحدة من التحديات اللي بتواجهنا And, and just on the building, because that's we've been talking about that a lot. That sounds very familiar to me. But in, in, in terms of like the maintenance of individual buildings, in our experience, we just usually have the owner, the, the people who are living in that building and in that community are just working on the buildings. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, so if the traditional building technique is actually better, it will be used again most of the time. So... You know, in, in Afghanistan, on those buildings, people have begun to put plastic sheeting under, on the roof, under the mud, to make it not leak. But it doesn't work. It's not breathable. There are a lot of problems. So when they fix their own roof with our funding and see that it doesn't leak when you use the correct material, <laughs> that it doesn't leak and that it breathes, They'll do it again. It's not more expensive than the plastic sheet. They just have to know how to do it. So I suppose where traditional building materials are actually better, if the people do it themselves the first time, they'll probably do it the second time. If, and I, in a little individual basis, I find that that works pretty well. Sure. Uh, Mike, second row, please. I think he's in French. <laughs> Je, je profite de ces, de ces questions d'interaction avec les, les, communautés lo, les communautés locales pour euh, essayer de faire un, un pendant avec euh, ce dont on parlait ce matin sur les, les conséquences des changements climatiques. Euh, avec le, les changements climatiques, on voit que le patrimoine souffre également euh, du fait de ces conséquences-là. Et ma réflexion, euh, parce qu'on euh, travaille également dans les contextes post-catastrophes naturelles, 
avec de plus en plus la communauté internationale de l'aide humanitaire ou d'intervention post-catastrophe naturelle venant à des processus qui sont dits self-recovery ou localisation, c'est-à-dire permettre aux communautés de se reconstruire par elles-mêmes sans forcément l'appui de structures extérieures, y compris si ce sont des ONG nationales. Est-ce que nous, professionnels de la réhabilitation du patrimoine, on est prêt à laisser les communautés travailler par elles-mêmes, y compris en faisant des erreurs pour se réapproprier le, les savoir-faire traditionnels Et est-ce que Alif, en tant que bailleur, est prêt à financer directement les communautés pour qu'elles puissent faire ce travail C'est une superbe question. Oui. <rire> C'est très superbe. Euh... J'ai quelqu'un du comité scientifique avec moi. <rire> je, je suis rassurée. <rire> euh, après, comment, comment nous travaillons aujourd'hui, c'est vraiment que les projets qu'on met en œuvre, on a besoin d'un garant scientifique, comme on, on l'appelle dans notre speak. Mais je pense que l'un n'exclut pas forcément de l'autre. Si là, si il y a, par exemple, comme Shoshana l'a expliqué, une certaine technique sur laquelle on veut travailler, la technique, elle est. Euh, J'essaie de, de faire de faire. Bon. Si si cette technique, la transmission de cette technique fait partie du projet, je pense que c'est tout à fait. Euh, je pense qu'Alif est tout à fait... Euh... C'est un important critère qu'on regarde quand on regarde les projets. Oui. Ce transfert de, de, de savoir-faire, euh, l'inclusion des, des communautés locales. Comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, c'est par rapport à toutes les phases du projet, pas juste l'exécution, de façon à ce que, de, dans le futur, de nouveaux projets seront euh, remontés par ces communautés directes, enfin, par des, des, des ONG ou des, des opérateurs locaux qui, qui vont pro, con, conceptualiser des, des nouveaux projets. Donc, euh, en fait, on commence par peut-être par un projet qui vient de d'un de, 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 opérateur un peu plus grand ou euh, d'un opérateur international, mais à, au bout du compte, ça, de, ça devrait commencer un élan qui, est, qui vient de la communauté elle-même au bout du compte. Et donc ça, c'est ça, c'est important euh, dans tous les projets qu'on regarde. Ça répond à votre question Ou pas, pas je, je le dis d'autant plus que je suis euh, euh, juge et parti oui. euh, cratère. Nous accompagnons beaucoup de projets dans ce sens-là, avec un appui technique extérieur, y compris en renforçant les capacités des, des ONG qui travaillent localement. Mm -hmm. Mais dans la mesure où il y a un, une nouvelle philosophie dans l'aide le, le, humanitaire, euh, en faisant le lien entre urgence, réhabilitation et développement, c'est de dire d'impulser les processus, et bien évidemment, c'est de dire de commencer par quelque chose et mettre les communautés dans une dynamique où elles pourraient faire par elles-mêmes. Oui, mais comme vous avez fait avec Crater, c'est le, le, le savoir-faire des, 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 des maçons, des, des maîtres artisans, des, de toute une économie, donc tout un, tout un savoir-faire qui, au bout du compte, se transfère même dans d'autres endroits euh, du Mali, euh, avec euh, les, euh, toutes ces connaissances qui peuvent se faire, qui peuvent s'échanger à travers tout un territoire en fait, pas juste dans la localité où le, le, le conflit a été. Euh, tout à fait, ouais. tout à fait. Le, ce, ce vers quoi je, je veux arriver, c'est la capacité des, des professionnels dont je partie de dire à un moment donné qu'il faut il faut lâcher prise en fait. C'est ce regard réflexif que j'ai par rapport à, à nos pratiques à nous, certes. On travaille dans le, le, la valorisation des cultures constructives locales. Euh, nous, à Grenoble, on dit par moment qu'on ne voit plus la montagne tellement elle est présente au quotidien et des gens viennent voir la montagne que nous ne, voisons, nous, 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 nous ne voyons plus. Donc, C'est la même manière avec les, les cultures constructives locales, y compris avec des, des sachants, des vieux maçons qui ont ces, ces capacités-là. Et quand on vient, j'espère qu'on ne vient plus comme ça, apprendre des autres 
pour transcrire et former, parce que c'est aussi euh, mieux comprendre ce qui fait sens et ce qui fait patrimoine dans ce que les gens font, et ensuite le diffuser comme étant une bonne pratique. Donc, jusqu'où sommes-nous prêts, nous, professionnels, à dire à un moment donné, le, le patrimoine, certes, on le regarde en tant que professionnel, mais en tant que bien matériel ou immatériel d'une communauté, il faut peut-être aussi à un moment donné lâcher et remettre la communauté au devant de sa responsabilité par rapport à la transmission qu'elle a su faire. Parce que si le patrimoine arrive jusqu'à nous aujourd'hui, c'est que ces communautés-là ont été en capacité de... C est, c est, ça peut être ambivalent qu'on propose euh, en travaillant tous les jours dans, dans ces contextes-là et de voir comment est-ce que, y compris les logiques de bailleurs et de professionnels, peuvent dire à ce moment-là, faisons confiance aux communautés pour qu'elles le fassent par elles-mêmes, quitte à, à ce qu'elles fassent des erreurs par moment, mais que le voilà d'apprendre de ces erreurs-là sans forcément euh, continuer à, à être présent. C'est voilà. Ça amène à une autre question euh, par rapport à le, le post-projet, en fait. Euh, D'un côté, euh, par rapport à... Euh, bon, je vais switcher en anglais, parce que c'est plus facile. On va switcher à le post-project. Qu'est-ce qui se passe après le ponctual project que Elif a fondé a été complété Uh, how do you monitor, how do you, uh, uh, how do you keep track of these projects in the future uh, and their progress and the, you know, the long-term kind of what you call value for money, you know, like over, <laughs> over time, how, how do you monitor that? Uh, or do you ha have you, have you, I mean, it's only been five, six years, so like, you know, there's not that many projects. Uh, yet, but how are you thinking of, of looking that, uh, of looking <coughs> at that, of, of keeping track of that uh, over time, to make sure that you know the all the effort that's been put in. <laughs> You're welcome. Anybody is. We, we have. Uh, I think it was last year that we have put in place a. Uh, so, as you say. Alif was created six years ago, operationally, I think we became four years ago, we were very much focused on launching, launching, let's say, the call, the, for, projects. The, the mm. call for projects, get the projects running, uh, provide support when necessary, and so on. So after we have, uh, we, we got to 150 projects, something like 120 projects, we, we have developed a kind of very uh, very simple. We try to keep things simple at a leaf and evaluation framework. So we we've, we I think it will, will be this this year that we will be starting on those who have finished, not finished, uh, go through more sy systematic evaluations. And but then I would also say that um, we Uh, with with some of the organizations, w Alif has grown, but also we have grown together with the organizations together. So when we've started with a smaller project, perhaps something is a bit more uh, larger scale is going on, and actually, perhaps one measure of success would be that when we have started with a smaller initiative, that we're now. Uh, in a position to do something bigger together, that's already a kind of measure of success mm. from my small point of view. Mm. I'm happy to pass on. Mm. No? But mm. projects, when they are uh, approved, do they always need to have an element of sustainability? Meaning, you know, you finish the renovation But do you require a vision and sort of a guide for how it's going to survive in the future? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think, I mean, from the scientific committee, we definitely look at that. It's not just the project from, right. you know, during the project uh, timeline, let's mm -hmm. say. It's really looking at the impact that it will have over time and it's life, you know, the life of. Uh, The life cycle of the project, of the, the where the project's being implemented and its possible ramifications. And, and you're not 
old enough yet to really be able to see many projects that have been finished. Well, I think there's and emergency projects that have been finished, because, I mean, from their nature, but, you know, these are really reactive kind of band-aid, first aid kind right. of kind of uh, projects where that that long-term impact is not necessarily uh, part, of the part of the, you know, the outcome. We're just trying to stop gap uh, and address, uh, you know, uh, it's first aid. So maybe 10, 15 years from yeah. now, right? you'll have a better vision of how did some of these projects that we financed in the early years, where are they now? Mm -hmm. I mean, that'll be interesting to see. Um, yeah. No, I was going to say that Shoshana and, uh, and, uh, and Chada, because they've been part of organizations mm -hmm. that are much, you know, that are older than Aleph, right. uh, can give some insights as to how they do that, how they monitor that. Yeah. Or if you do. Shada, do you want to go? No, no, you go ahead. Okay. So, um, I think it's scale is really important, and I also think that sustainability, and by that I mean organizational and financial sustainability, not environmental, is a sort of terrible buzzword that gets thrown around, and it can mean very different things, right? We're talking about projects in co mostly in conflict zones. Mm -hmm. The idea that a project is going to write like a 20-year financial plan for a building that's going to work is the wrong question. No, and you all don't ask it. I yeah. mean, you all, no. totally, you all do. It's more exactly. of a social sustainability yeah. aspect. So that's where I think scale really matters, yeah. right? If you, like, if it's, I don't know if this will work, but it will. Um, so if we're talking about somebody's house that was destroyed by a fire, the point is they don't have anywhere to live. So then it gets fixed and they're in their house again. That is a relatively straightforward burning need emergency project, yes, was true of the um, restaurant de Kabul al-Qadim, which is the old Kabul restaurant, um, uh, which was a thriving business and hotel, and it fell down, and then it was put back up. There, you had a business, you know, you had a guy who ran his business there, and it worked well, and the building needed to be put back up. So I think those are two examples where you need to ask the question, and you do, and then it's explained, and I think that's more straightforward. I think that the, the lar you know, when we're talking about a tourism site and more complex finances and things, it, it is harder to be exact about what will happen in the future. Um, for us, really the sustainability of, of this project has been about creating the institute in, in that big hole, the snow hole. <laughs> um, creating this institute there, because that is an Afghan institution with an Afghan board that continues. Now, that needs funding. It's an, it's an educational institution, right? That's not financially viable. That needs funding, but it is something that will continue to be funded. From that come these craft businesses, also architectural training, so then there's maintenance built in for how people remud their walls every two years. So that's a very complex system. And the way that I judge it 16 years later is that the houses are being maintained and that, and we do, you know, we do socioeconomic surveys every three or four years to check employment levels and check healthcare use and things. But th those complex systems are harder to plan these are, these are great tools to kind of uh, share uh, in terms of monitoring the, the long-term uh, social sustainability yeah. of projects. Yeah. We're going to have to wrap up, okay. unfortunately. I think I uh, see people no, uh, getting... Oh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 so, it's fine. But I, I would, you know, uh, encourage you all to to uh, continue the discussion. I mean, that's, this is just a catalyst for, for exchange. Um, maybe before we leave, if there's any... Kind of insights on, uh, w yeah, would you like I, I think there is one topic we, we haven't touched we, yeah. upon so far. I think, I mean, I, I, I realize it's not a popular one, but I think we should say a few words about it. It's, it's the transparency, yes. which is yes. a huge challenge in the, in the context of, uh, of uh, not just heritage, but, I mean, doing projects in conflict areas. I mean, uh, and we realize, I mean, we, we, we deal with... Uh, countries with uh, uh, uneven economies, with a rule of law which is pretty weak, 
uh, and uh, sometimes even a failed state. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult subject. And uh, we, we, we try to, um, to, to, to draft a transparency policy with uh, the, the, the help of our audit committee. And I actually wanted to, to give the word to, to Jeff to, to, so that he can say a few words about the, the way we approach the, the, the topic. Uh, you need to be transparent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you need to communicate. And you need to be honest. Because at the basis of everything is trust, right? Our donors, whether they're states or individuals, trust the team to use the money wisely. The team needs to know from you that you're using the money wisely, which means show us how you're doing it. I mean, do the best to back up and explain to us how you're using it. Um, I don't know all your processes for you know, documenting when you make progress payments, but it's really important for everybody in the chain to have the ability and the the confidence to trust the other people in the group. So um, whatever those requirements are, try to meet them. Um, if you have a problem with some aspect of it, talk to the team, uh, because the, the trust and confidence is critical for everybody in this process. Um, yeah. uh, Many organizations, I mean, draft kilometers of policies, mm. and I fully respect that because, I mean, they, they implement their own projects, so they, they need these rules. I mean, it, it's not the approach we adopted uh, when we started because, I mean, we, I mean, obviously we have our own set of rules for our internal operation, our, our internal finances, but we try not to impose them to our grantees because the, um, of uh, the variety of geographies and projects we do. Mm. What we want to make sure when we do the due diligence of projects, we want to make sure that these issues have been uh, taken into consideration ahead of the project, that you have thought about these issues, that you have a strategy. Uh, for example, if we take the example of uh, a procurement policy, I mean, we don't uh, demand that uh, grantees' procurement policy would be a copy of ours. We just want to make sure that they have thought about it, even if it's a tiny organization with just half a page of, I mean, just they know exactly what, how they, they will sign off on expenses, that they have a rule, even if it's a simple one. Just, we want to just to make sure that they have thought about it. And what we do with um, uh, the great help of, uh, of Najat, my uh, grand finance officer, uh, at the time of the reporting, we, we, we try to compare the rules they have set for themselves and the reporting they're doing. Mm. Great. Um, I just want to talk about, before we leave, so I just wanted to talk about looking ahead. So. Uh, maybe, you know, now that you've kind of, we, we've had this discussion and, and we're able to understand better, like how, what LF's expectations are, how does LF work in terms of reviewing and uh, uh, supporting uh, the implementation of projects, uh, how do you think we could be encouraging m more uh, local operators to kind of, you know, uh, uh, Join the family, <laughs> um, because sometimes this might feel daunting. Maybe some of you could answer this if you are small uh, small operators, and maybe you've been daunted by by you know uh, uh, perhaps reporting transparency issues, uh, money challenge, uh, money wiring challenges, like all of these things. So, uh, are th is there anything that you would like that would help you, encourage you or facilitate for you? Uh, uh, proposing projects uh, in, uh, for funding. No? Good, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Good, that's <laughs> great. Everybody is I, I, be, yeah, be, be well, ready for many, many applications for the call for projects. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> well, perhaps you could describe, I mean, you, you explained something to me the other day that sometimes when uh, project operators have trouble um, meeting some of the requirements or documenting things, you actually add into the budget a resource mm. that they could hire to do these kinds of things. Okay. So, you know, which I, I think is creative and a brilliant idea, 
just help you do what we need you to do so that we all feel comfortable um, giving you the money so you can do the work. One of the um, most, I mean, one of the greatest pride uh, among the 180 projects we've done is, is supporting this tiny uh, um, NGO in, uh, in Niger, Iman Atarik, uh, with the restoration of the old city of Agadez in Niger. I mean, it's a tiny organization, and they had, they, uh, Mohamed, he had, he had the, the, obviously the scientific and technical expertise, obviously the knowledge and experience of the local context. You know how to, to manage people on, on the ground. What he was missing is practical experience of financial uh, management and reporting, but we were very happy to support him in the, in the um, I mean, do, do, doing so. I mean, we're so happy. I think it, it should be Alice's mission to support these uh, small local NGOs to, to grow. So we, I mean, we're welcoming uh, 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 proposals from, from, from this type of organizations too. There's a question. Sir, I don't see. Oh, the lady. Yes. All right. Okay. Yes, thank you for this workshop. Very uh, interesting insights from uh, Riwa and uh, Afghanistan. So um, I, re I represent Sursok Museum, who was a partner with Alif. And thanks to your help, we were able to secure the first phase of their rehabilitation works. And uh, actually, it helped the museum to fundraise as a second phase and finish. Mm -hmm. So today we finished uh, restoring the museum. And uh, I wanted to just uh, ask about how do you envision post-crisis? So once we rehabilitated, as we said, the building is now uh, finished. Do you envision also your partnership as a post-crisis also helping, for example, preserve archives? Or is it really mainly the grants are towards emergency response? It's not just emergency, obviously. I mean, we, we have calls for projects that, uh, uh, that uh, encompass, I mean, uh, other types of projects. But we realized during the last six years that we definitely have an added value when it comes to emergency. Uh, when it comes to large-scale projects that span over many years and that requires huge amounts of funds, I mean, we, we would be happy to contribute, but we know that there are other type of organizations that can do it maybe uh, with more, ex I mean, if we just take the, I mean, the example of UNESCO, I mean, it, 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 I mean yeah. So emergency, yes, we do, we, 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 we're very happy to do emergency. We don't do only emergency, but uh, I think it's, from my point of view at least, it's definitely our, our uh, key asset. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the... I think the working, the uh, LF is really based on action, on flexibility. I mean, as you can see, flexibility even in terms of implementing projects, like, you know, uh, cost, time, uh, uh, taking into consideration <coughs> the risks on the ground. All of this, make this is a strength of LF, unlike other organizations, to be able to be so flexible with uh, grantees, I think. Uh, Agreed. I just want to come back to what uh, Jeff and Laurent were saying about, yeah, but they're still having the coffee break. If you guys want to stay a little longer, we can keep on discussing. I, I have visibility there. They're not gone yet. <laughs> I, want to, I wanted to give uh, Shoshana just a, a chance, uh, Shoshana and Chada, to, to talk about uh, what, other, what other tools or um, um, support mechanisms uh, do you think would be beneficial to support uh, smaller operators where there might be a lack in terms of project management or financial management, other than the, you know, the tool that Laurent and, and uh, uh, Jeff uh, were discussing? Yeah, mentoring Capacity. across different organizations. <laughs> do you think of any? Um, oh, yeah, mentoring. Not really. I think I second what you have said. Um, and the, the, uh, the issue that doesn't only have to do with Aleph, it also has to do with our localities, is that we're really working in islands. So <laughs> bringing locals together, as mentioned earlier in Iraq, but also in other places is the case where, because we have knowledge that uh, we can complement the work of other organizations and other com organizations can complement what we're lacking. And I think this sort of network um, is missing uh, 
because of being overwhelmed, being mm -hmm. under pressure of financial stability, we need to <laughs> to plan ahead. We need to have the, the the salaries for our staff to continue for the next year and the other, and also growing our organization and reflecting and monitoring and evaluation and doing this sort of things. We're really overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, there's also the issues of fragmentation politically and in terms of, uh, yani you're dealing with very complex situations where bringing people together, even in smaller uh, scale uh, context, relatively, is an issue that, if done, can uh, be of great benefit. Uh, because we, we have many resources that are missing. If we put them together, we'll be uh, working better. Mm -hmm. That one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. The, the only thing we talked about yeah. recently, I, I totally agree. We're all too busy. Nobody collaborates. We're all terrible. My fault. Everybody's <laughs> fault. We're all terrible. More, yeah, within country, I think that's what matters. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that our younger staff, like our younger heritage practitioners really care about is mentoring. Like somebody slightly older than them mm -hmm. working in a similar context is incredibly helpful. Like they don't need particular um, training courses, because there's a lot of that. It's more the, I think, professional connections. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that will be uh, probably our last comment, and then we'll close. Um, but I think it's important. Uh, two things. Um, working with strong national staff, that's how we've been able to continue. After the fall of Kabul, I was evacuated for a few months. Engineer Mahayman, the engineering team stayed. I'm the only foreigner with TM now, but those guys are so technically strong, but they do need a lot of my help and also Alev's help to get them up to speed to manage donor programs. Um, and how we've been able to continue is the strength of those guys. And it's those staff who will go on to start small organizations in the future. So I think one, supporting them, and then to the mentorship that Shoshana said, I mean, we give a lot of our time and energy, but Afghanistan feels really cut off and isolated right now. But every day I'm so inspired by what the teams are doing. And we already chat a lot with our friends at AKTC, Mustafa and other are sharing their knowledge, but I would love, they would love the chance to share their great work broadly and globally. That will really, I think, give them this like added strength to continue. And also they could learn from, from other heritage experts in the world. So two suggestions, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so. 20 seconds. Uh, 20 seconds. <laughs> Maybe you could okay. get Sandra's, Sandra's, Sandra's giving us the, the, the cutoff point, but I, yes. It's amazing that yeah. I don't want yeah. No, I was just gonna conclude and to ask you to please continue the discussion with any one of the moderators or anybody in the in the audience. Uh, if you can catch the coffee break before the majlis. If